Hello. Uh, so today and, uh, and Wednesday, we are going to be talking about health. Um, of course, this is something that has received a heightened attention in the last uh, couple of years for some reason. Um, and uh, I'll be talking about, uh, to roughly speaking, I'll have one lecture on uh, demand and one lecture on supply. Um, although it's possible that today's lecture runs a little longer and we'll finish it over, uh, over Wednesday. Uh, in the demand for health, one could uh, talk about many, many things, but uh, the one thing I want to focus is uh, why people seem to want uh, treatments like antibiotics and steroids, but uh, not vaccination or other preventive care. Something we are seeing in the context of the COVID vaccine, where it's the same people who want to uh, consume invermectin in, in and, uh, and, and who refuse to get uh, vaccinated. So somehow there is a, um, there seem to be a, um, a disconnect between, so it's not, for example, the, some people who don't want to get vaccinated against various things are against all sorts of uh, treatments like uh, Jehovah's Witnesses or uh, Christian Science uh, followers. But the, the vast majority of people are not, don't don't want to or are not so excited about getting vaccinated uh, or uh, you know taking iron pills uh, or uh, doing all sorts of other preventive things but uh, love uh, curative medicine that's something that we are you know perhaps a lot of uh, we are discovering a new uh, in the US today uh, with respect to the COVID vaccination or even the flu shot but it's something that if you work on development, uh, you've encountered <laughs> many times. Uh, for example, we have a, a survey in, uh, in Udaipur, uh, very ancient now, but uh, um, still uh, the, the main fact is, uh, is still true, still holds, uh, which shows that uh, in this super poor household in Udaipur, spend 8% uh, of their budget on, on, on health. Um, and the people spent uh, more, you know, the people are willing to spend like 5,000 rupees on health on some extreme, uh, on some extreme event, which is much more when they, are, they, are, they consume uh, uh, usually. So they are willing to go into debt in order to get uh, antibiotics. Uh, we find that they, in that same survey that uh, these super poor households have consulted someone for a healthcare episode uh, uh, several times in the last month. Uh, they are going to all sorts of people. They are going to uh, um, traditional healer. They are to going to a regular allopathic doctor. They are doing, going to quacks, like pharmacists who call themselves doctors. Uh, they are quite sophisticated about managing these different sources, uh, although the models might be whatever it is. But then in that same sample, uh, uh, there is a, a surprisingly low take up uh, for uh, a preventive medicine. For example, that same sam sample of Udaipur uh, a few years ago, less than 5% of children were fully immunized against uh, uh, you know, the, the basic childhood diseases. So they, that received uh, the five extended uh, medicine. Another fact which is related to it is high, super uh, high price elasticity for technologies that, that are known to be uh, uh, widely effective, bed nets, immunization, deworming, etc. So looking for uh, first at, uh, this is a graph by, uh, uh, put together by Pascaline Dupa for a paper in science that looks at uh, uh, elasticity for positive prices for all sorts of uh, different uh, goods and different places uh, from various studies. And what you see is that in particular at very, very low prices, a uh, uh, steep uh, fall in demand. Not necessarily exactly at zero, so it's not necessarily from zero to, to, uh, to another price. At the beginning, this is what people believe, like you have this huge, uh, huge drop at zero. Uh, f from zero, 60% of people take chlorine when it's zero and it turns to 10% when it's 20 cents. But it's not just that, for example, here you have the, the in for, for bed nets, you have the steep drop a little higher. What is interesting is that a lot of these, these falls, if you exclude these two, a lot of these falls are, are 
you know, the levels are relatively comparable, even though the things are completely different and they have very different costs. So people are equally elastic for uh, an iron pill that uh, literally costs a few cents as for a bed net that costs uh, many dollars or seven or eight dollars. Um, and where they probably would be able to tell you that the, the, the cost to deliver the households to them is different and the value is different because from the bed net you would get a stream of, uh, of, uh, of services over a long time, it's a durable versus, a, versus a, a, a pill that you take just once. So this is a, it doesn't seem to, that it's, it could come out of, a, of any reasonable model, all of this like super sharp drop of, um, of take up at very high, at very uh, uh, low prices. Uh, in addition to the, the elasticity, the price elasticity uh, uh, being high at, uh, for any positive prices, you also have high price elasticity for any negative price. Uh, so um, looking at, um, looking at uh, immunization, um, so yeah, no, so let me get there. Uh, in a minute, so I'll go back to immunization, but with the COVID-19 vaccine, you get this uh, tiny incentives. People are giving uh, lottery tickets, so that's, that might be big. If you win, but your point of winning being so low, it's actually a tiny incentive, or a beer or something like that. Now, I don't know that, so that people, there, 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 is, there is actually at least one study from the Netherlands on the impact of this incentive, showing that these incentives f seem to be uh, to have very large, uh, reasonably large effects. I'll show um, evidence of the impact of incentive on immunization in a moment. But certainly there is a widespread belief that these small incentives move behavior, so you can think of them as a, as a price, as a negative price that you give to people. So it's symmetric around zero. You pay people a little bit to do something, and then they, they do it in a large part. So there are two counter arguments to, the, to this idea that people are very price elastic. Um, one is that, well, maybe uh, people are not so price elastic, but if you offer things for zero, a bunch of people who have uh, no interest in the thing are going to get it anyway because at zero, you know, you, you, your valuation is always going to be a little bit higher than zero, even if, for example, even t potentially to, to do something else with it. Um, so, uh, so, for example, with bed nets, uh, there was this idea that uh, people would take the bed net, uh, uh, not because they are interested in the bed nets, uh, but because they could use it for something else, they could use it as a piece of cloth, so you could make a fishing net out of it or something like that. Uh, so in that case, when you give things for free, as opposed to putting a small cost, then you draw in a lot of people, but you don't draw in people who are interested in help. You are drawing in people who are, uh, who's, who's you know, because the, even if you have no interest in the health, you, you, have, you might have another interest in that thing that is just big enough that at zero, you, you, for zero, you would take it. So in that case, there would be no mystery. It's just that there is just a bunch of people who are not interested, but at zero would come in just in case, you know. So there is actually several people that look at that. And the, uh, the test there is whether once people, for example, acquire a bed net, um, do they use it? Or uh, in Ashraf Berry Shapiro, or uh, another device, I think it's water, water uh, treatment. Uh, once you get the water treatment, are you actually putting it in the water? So if, you, if, if your valuation of the bed nets for the goal of, for the purpose of, uh, for the purpose of, of health is zero, then uh, you're not going to use it as a bed net once you get it for free. In addition, there is another argument people make, which is the very fact that you've paid zero for a good makes you think it's worth, worth less. So there might be some behavioral thing on top of it. That would also mean that if you don't pay for a good, it also reduces your, your uh, valuation of that good as a health good. The two combined have the prediction that uh, uh, if, uh, uh, in fact, the real elasticity is, is, is lower, but there are just a lot of people who are not interested. 
uh, we should find that people who get a good for free are, not, are less likely to use it. So the first paper to test that was uh, uh, Cohen and uh, Pascaline uh, Dupin and uh, Jessica Cohen, who did a, f uh, a first study um, distributing free bed nets or bed nets at some prices in, um, along with the first uh, maternity checkups. And what they did later is that they did, uh, they did uh, uh, random checks to see whether the people were used at follow-up. And what they find is that a conditional on having a net, so including both the treatment effect potentially as well as the selection effect, which is what we are interested in today, the, the use of the bed net is actually the same regardless of the prices you take it, uh, you get, you pay. Now, uh, of course, it's conditional on getting a net, but since you are much more likely to have a net if it was for free, the effective coverage by a net is in fact highly price elastic, the same way that I was showing you before. So if I showed you the, the effective coverage, which, mean, which is the uh, probability to have a net multiplied by the probability to use it, uh, this is in fact uh, highly dependent on how much, people, uh, uh, how much people need to pay. And even at 50 uh, uh, Kenyan shilling per, uh, per net, we are now at uh, um, one third of the or, or one sixth of the of the full price, so it's still much much lower than the full price. Nobody is willing to pay anymore. So that price elasticity seems real uh, for the use of uh, of a bed net. Uh, um, they also make uh, in a in a. So likewise, I was as I was saying. There are large reactions to small uh, positive incentives for immunization, uh, such as the ones that are proposed for, uh, for uh, a COVID-19 vaccine. The first uh, study I know about <laughs> is uh, um, a paper that uh, Abhijit, uh, uh, Rachel Glenster, Dhruva Kotari, and myself wrote on, uh, in, on Udaipur, the same area where we did the survey. You know, we were really struck by this 5% full immunization rate and wanted to do something about it. So we did uh, what Dean Carlin has called conditional lentil transfer instead of conditional cash transfer. So we did a small experiment in 130 villages. 60 got randomly assigned to receive regular immunization camp. And so that's already a, a big improvement over what they had normally, because normally they were supposed to go uh, this time to the to the health clinic, which was closed a lot of the time. And so maybe you, maybe it's just hard for them to get immunized because you show up with your kid, walk two kilometers, show up with your kid, the nurse is not there. Maybe you're not gonna do it again. They'd actually, uh, maybe it was in fact extraordinarily expensive. So the first thing we, d we wanted to do is to sort of simulate what would happen if the, uh, the camps were really ultra regular. Would it be sufficient to bring everyone to immunization camp? Uh, so again, in the COVID-19 vaccine, questions have been raised, in particular for people from minorities around access and making it as simple as possible. So here, suppose we make it as simple as regular as possible. So the NGO we work with, Seva Mandir, made uh, an agreement with the government of uh, Rajasthan to kind of take over ammunition services in 60 villages. They hired the nurse, they were there every month, rain or shine, all of the camps were held, they were in a central location in the village. So make it quite easy. Then in half of those, uh, we uh, offered small incentives to get immunized. And the small incentive was uh, a kilo of lentil per shot, plus one set of plates for finishing the shot. So it's actually, uh, there, there is both a, in, there is kind of a slope to it. It's convex, uh, which is going to be relevant for the rest of what we're going to do today. And uh, we found pretty large impact. Uh, oops. This is uh, immunization in the control hamlet. Uh, so at end, end line, it was, it was about 6%. In, in intervention A uh, hamlet, uh, that's uh, the ones that just got the camps. So that's already about doubling uh, to about 12%. And then if in intervention B Hamlet, when we added the incentive, it comes to about 37%. So that in fact, that throws in so many kids that the, uh, it is cheaper to offer the kid fully immunized 
turns out to be cheaper to offer the incentive than not offer the incentive uh, because uh, the, the nurse was more occupied, so the cost per shot goes down. The full cost increases, but you have m more kids. But it means even counting the transfer as a cost, it's actually cheaper to provide incentive than not to provide them. In this case, uh, it has to be a, a, a function of uh, not very many people getting, getting immunized without the incentive and a large treatment effect. Uh, furthermore, for the, uh, we find li very little spillover to the neighboring villages uh, of just having the camp. So people do not seem to be walking nearby in order to get immunized. On the other hand, we find spillovers when, when the incentive is there. Uh, so this bar is bigger than, than this one, for example. So uh, uh, showing that you know, people will not move to get immunized, but they'll, 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 they'll come for the, for the kilo of lentils. So that suggests that maybe um, the COVID vaccine uh, incentives might work. It actually, but there, are, there is, however, one big difference in the context, which is where we ask people in Udaipur whether they think immunization is a good thing. They all think it's great, and they all would like to do it. So 98% of people, and we did the same survey in Haryana, you read the, the, the gossip paper, where we did the immunization uh, context. In this context, everybody tells you that they would really like to have their kids immunized. So when people have asked me about the incentives for the COVID vaccine, I was like, well, there are some people who might want to do it and don't get around to do it, and then the incentive might work. But it is less clear that someone might be convinced by a small incentive if they don't want it in the first place. So that creates a, a, a very different uh, context um, because, uh, and that's why we have to think about what causes these very large responses uh, to the incentives. So why are, this, why, why are those? So these are just you know, a few examples, but there are many others. Uh, um, Rebecca Santon has a paper on uh, giving people incentives to get their tiny incentives to get their HIV test results after the test had already been taken anyway. So it doesn't even involve the shots. It's just getting the results and find very large impact of, uh, getting, uh, of uh, getting a small incentive to collect your HIV AIDS test results. Um, she also finds that if the tent to collect the result is a little further away, people don't go. So in, in a sense, in the same paper, she has a response to you know, the negative, co the cost of having to travel uh, you know, the walking cost versus the, the, the cost of the small incentive and find the same thing in both papers. So these are just two examples, uh, but there are many, many others. Um, and now, in particular, there are replication of this small incentive for immunization in many contexts, uh, most uh, recently in Pakistan, uh, in a paper in which I was involved, but also in Ethiopia in, and in other places. Uh, it's the basis for the conditional cash transfer approach, uh, which has become uh, very popular in many countries. And, but of course, those cash transfers are, are much larger. So it's still, although it's very popular, it's pretty puzzling in light of uh, a demand for health model where people are responsive to benefits and responsive to costs, because the benefits to preventive health are fairly large, are very large. And that's why I was, ask, I was pointing out that, okay, are, are people aware of these benefits? Maybe they are not. In the case of the immunization in the US, maybe the, the remaining people who are not vaccinated are not aware of the benefits. So for them, the, these benefits are balanced by very large costs. But in the case of, 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 of uh, Rajasthan or Haryana, it seems that people are aware of the benefits to some extent. At least they are aware enough that they're willing to tell you that there are such benefits. Um, by the way, I don't know what the, the answer about COVID vaccines are different. There is also a great amount of hesitancy for COVID vaccine in India that you don't see for childhood vaccination. Uh, and that I don't know whether it's because it's the first adult vaccine that they have since they, they are no regular flu shot vaccines, so it's something unusual, or whether it is because the same kind of disinformation that floats in the US somehow makes its way, makes its way in all of these countries as well. I don't think we, we know that yet. 
But in the case of childhood vaccination, or maybe they just, you know, uh, we'll talk a bit about social norm in a minute. Maybe people feel that they, you want them to hear that the childhood vaccination is safe and effective and they should do it. So that's what they tell you. And, but they think it's okay to say that the, uh, the vaccines are not, for COVID are not safe because that's what everybody around them is saying. It's possible that it's the case as well. So, but the, so, so all of these goods have large benefits. People seem to care about their health since they are spending so much money on treatment. It's not that they care and in particular. They won't immunize their kids for measles, but if the kid has measles, they will spend tons of money <laughs> like trying to get them better. Um, and the prices or the opportunity cost are not that high to begin with. A lot of these goods are heavily subsidized or they are free and all you have to do is to, you know, spend some time to take some time off to get the kid vaccinated. So what are the possible uh, explanations? So one of the most popular explanations in economics is prison bias. So if you remember uh, the model we just uh, uh, saw for savings, people might have very different preferences the present uh, and in the future. So here in the, in the, in, in, in the case of uh, immunization, think of, uh, you know, being, have it, being immunized at something you value in the, in the future and uh, not being, you know, the, the, the time that you spent in front of the television instead of getting immunized as a temptation good. So it's in the space of time as opposed to or, or inconvenience as opposed to being in the space in the in the space of money. Uh, so you think that you know you would like so today you you think about the benefits of immunization in the future they look good, but you don't experience any today because today your kid is not exposed to the measles, or today your kid is not there is no an, any benefit today. There'll be benefits in the future. But the, the, the temptation of staying home is today. The temptation of using, uh, of using uh, some of your time is today. And you don't, you don't value that time for tomorrow. So you will always want to wait and do it some other time. So uh, in that case, uh, a small cost today discouraged actions, but it could be undone by a small benefit today. For example, the bag of lentils or the plates. Um, and you, you, that would give you an argument for preventive care subsidies, no, and not just immunization, not just uh, positive prices, but also subsidies. Um, not just because of externalities reason, which in and of itself would justify that we pay household to get immunized, so they internalize the benefits to other people in the community, but also for internality because the small benefit received today is going to outweigh. Uh, the, 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 la the, the small cost uh, uh, hard today. And at some level, you should give ice cream in the camps as opposed to money in this context because you have a temptation against your temptation and that'll be great. Uh, so in that sense, the beer um, is, might be kind of the ideal form of an incentive. Uh, if indeed, uh, present bias was uh, um, a, a big reason uh, why people don't get immunized, then incentives would not be the only way that you could go about it. Uh, uh, for example, one thing that would be powerful is default option, which is basically you have to opt out to not get your kid immunized. So the form of mandates that are present for childhood immunization in many countries, including the US, it's not that you cannot uh, refuse to get your child immunized, but if you do, it's going to be inconvenient. You have to find a doctor that is willing to sign you uh, a form, or you have to find a religious leader who is going to give you uh, the religious exemption. Uh, and so that's a bit of a pain. So that can be interpreted in, the, in, in this framework by saying, well, you know, by default, your kid is going to be immunized for all of these uh, diseases. And if you want to get out of the default, you have to do something slightly painful. So that's kind of this idea of nudge or choice infrastructure is that, you know, the default is going to push you in that direction, uh, uh, not, not just because it's, it kind of shows you what to do, 
which is, might also be part of the impact of default, by the way, but also because it, uh, it, uh, it sets up a barrier. So that's why in most for childhood immunization, I think in most uh, of the developed countries, we don't have incentives. We have mandates that are not very hard mandates. We can see that in the case of the COVID-19 vaccine, the mandates are actually much harder. And they are now only for adults, but uh, in places like, for example, if you're a healthcare worker, you lose your job. So that's not a nudge. It's a, so it's a different kind of mandate. Uh, uh, and they don't give, uh, at least in, for example, in my pediatrician office, there's a big placard saying, we are not giving medical exemption for the COVID-19 vaccine. So I think they are making the, partly because the reason why people are refusing COVID-19 vaccines are different. They are, they are refusal, not an inertia. Um, not uh, this kind of uh, present bias framework, then if you want your mandate to be effective, it needs, it's actually a proper mandate. Uh, so in, but for childhood immunization, if the issue is really a hyperbolic discounting issue is that you want to do it, but it's kind of never quite the right time, uh, then a default option would help. Uh, another thing that might help is to help people to commit so in the same way that uh, for the savings, uh, saving, we saw the uh, uh, Ashraf, uh, Carlin, and Nien looking at uh, giving people commitment savings option. Uh, Dean Carlin and Xavier Ginet have a paper in the Philippines uh, called, where they offer a program called CARES, not to be confused with the unemployment uh, relief in the US. Uh, where people uh, are offered this like incredibly attractive savings account, which is it's an account that pays zero interest, uh, where um, you uh, you ad you agree if you put the money to submit yourself to a smoking test, and if you fail the smoking test, you lose the money. So that incredibly attractive product should really be taken by no one unless they are very keen to stop smoking uh, because you might fail the test. Uh, in fact, 10% of people take up, take up the program when they're offered, so it's not everyone. Uh, but it's comparable to the take up of smo smoking cessation offers uh, when they are made uh, in the US, for example. And of the people who were offered the program, uh, 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 they were 3% more likely to stop smoking than people who were not offered the program. So assuming uh, that uh, being offered the program doesn't have a direct effect, and therefore we can use the offer of, of the program as an instrument for stopping smoking. And now I'll let you, uh, as homework, think about whether that's a good assumption or not. But if you are willing to assume it, that gives you a treatment effect of the uh, of being actually signed up of 33 percent, 10 divided by three, which is a pretty large uh, account. So, the fact that uh, you know anybody is willing to do that, and I, uh, that of those people there was actually some success involved, is also consistent uh, with these commitment problems. And of course, the papers you saw, the paper on alcohol that you saw with. Uh, uh, um, with Frank, uh, again, uh, goes in this direction. I do have one uh, misgiving uh, with uh, this type of commitment-based, uh, commitment problem, time inconsistency problem-based uh, explanation for preventive health, in particular vaccination, which is that it really requires people to, to, to keep being fooled by themselves. You know, you have to think, I'm going to, I'm not going to do, do it today, but I value it, and I'm going to do it tomorrow. But then when tomorrow ro rolls along, you again not do it. And take into, take for example, the example of our immunization camp. Every single month, there is an immunization camp. Every single month, they fail to go. I mean, after a while, they should have gotten the memo that, you know, and figured something out. And at the same time, we're saying people are sophisticated enough to sign up for commitment devices. Well, then I have trouble thinking that are not sophisticated. If they can sign up for a CARES commitment device to stop smoking, of course, these are different households. But in the context of Udaipur, uh, we could find, uh, I'm sure, a lot of evidence showing a certain degree of sophistication. Then, you know, how 
but they continue not going month after month after month till the kid uh, finally gets misery. That that doesn't you know it's kind of hard if they really understand the benefit the huge benefit that we think they are. If they are, then it seems a little bit uh, unlikely. You see my point? So 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 even though I I. So this is this type of explanation that intuitively is very sensible and a lot of pieces of evidence uh, kind of gel, but quantitatively it makes no sense at some level. And I haven't given you a quantitative calibration, but I've made one, you know, in my head for you. Like it somehow, it goes in the right direction, but it doesn't like it, it doesn't pass. So that's my issue. As long as the benefits are in fact as large as possible. So one other possibility is that. Um, people uh, um, are just not informed. So, so one of the things is that these huge benefits, they exist. They are not balanced by huge cost, by the way. Oh, another explanation for, huge, for low take-up would be people are scared or there are huge costs associated with it. But in that case, they wouldn't be swayed by small incentive. Right? This is the, uh, the discussion we had on the COVID vaccine. You have to have a real mandate to move poor people who really don't want to do it because they think there is a big cost. Yeah. Um, just on the last point, you made, um, uh, in most of these types of experiments and things, are these camps things that are going to happen in one month in the village and not come back for several years? Or is it like a situation where that vaccination camp will happen month after month or year after year and just that this one happens to be? run by say a month or a month and I'm just thinking about like what is that outside option if I don't take up one of these Oh, so in this case, I think they could have expected Sevamander to continue to do to run the camps yeah. because it was not done as, done as an experiment. So from the from their point of view, it's a program by Sevamander. And in fact, as far as I know, they are still running those camps. Uh, like, you know, Twenty years later, they are still. So the reason I ask is: Is there anything in the behavioral theory that you're saying to calibrate well uh, that that has to do with like that outside option, like? A yeah, yeah. So, th so that's a good point, which is uh, uh, something that uh, I think in Matthew Rabin suggested once we do is to have a deadline and to say if you want to get your kids immunized at the camp in this village, that's this month. And then after that, we are not coming back. So this is without deadline. Uh, so th this is just uh, this would. Uh, yes. Um, and couldn't it be the case that people are not getting like this preventive help because they don't have time for it. I, in Chile, one of the biggest issues with the COVID vaccine is that vaccination camps were open where people went, were working. So they had like no permission from their bosses to like leave work and get vaccinated because otherwise they would get fired. So they didn't get vaccinations because there wasn't like the right amount of time during the day to do that. So. Yeah, so here it's going to take them some time. Um, you know, a lot of these people, are, particularly the moms, are, it's not that they're working somewhere, but they, have, they are very busy. They have stuff to do. So you need to take some time off. So think of that as the, as the opportunity cost. The description you are giving in Chile is like super high opportunity cost, but I think these people have quite low opportunity cost. Uh, that, you know, and that's, but th that's low opportunity cost. Including plus the fact that the kid might be get a bit sick and all that. Those are the costs you're going to experience today, in exchange of a benefit, a flow of benefits in the future. And then uh, uh, these are not very big costs. So we can we can you know out out compensate them, balance them out with the small benefit. Uh, but in your, your example for today is that if the costs happen to be large, then they they even had to like. Uh, write a law that said that if you get fired by the boss because you want to get a COVID vaccine, then they're going to sue the, that firm. So. And, and, and so should they. <laughs> this is, uh, yes. So, so yeah, there, there might be situations. That's also what they were saying at the beginning of the vaccine here is that some people had real issues with access. And in India, the, so I don't want to belittle the, 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 the access issue. In India, for childhood vaccination, for years, this was the only thing the government was trying to do, is to really improve the access. And it has improved. It's much better than it was. Uh, and the vaccination take up is still low. So it's not the only uh, part of it. So one possibility is that people, 
it's not that there are huge benefits and then huge costs, but that the benefits, uh, the costs are low and also the benefits are low. Not the real one, but the perceived one. Um, and in fact, there is plenty of evidence that people do not, that there is a lot of relevant piece of information people don't have. Uh, and so they might not realize what are the benefits uh, associated with a particular behavior. So for example, I mentioned uh, um, HIV uh, education in, in, uh, in Kenya, which is uh, insisted on this ABCD program, abstain, be faithful, uh, use a condom or you die. And it's not that program uh, doesn't have one key piece of information which is that the rate of getting HIV is much higher. The rate of being contaminated by HIV is much higher for older men than for younger boys, as it would be since it doesn't go away once you're contaminated. You're contaminated. And also because uh, older men, in fact, have uh, um, you know, risky sexual behavior, often have uh, uh, many girls uh, that they kind of uh, pay for sex and so on and so forth. So they are called sugar daddies. Um, so Pascaline Dupas, for her uh, job market paper, uh, um, did an experiment on where she uh, just uh, gave uh, uh, girls and boys a piece of inf uh, the information that uh, the rate of HIV is much higher. Just it was basically giving them information on rate of HIV positivity in Kenya among older men, younger boys, and then also women. And they, by the way, when other thing you find is girls are more likely to be able to be contaminated, which is something they didn't know. So that's that is something that uh, kids did not know. And then the way she looked at the impact is by looking at uh, pregnancy, because HIV is rare and hard to to test. Uh, but pregnancy is a pretty good uh, indication of risky uh, sexual behavior. And she finds. Uh, 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 a decline in, in, in pregnancy of uh, 31 percent. Uh, uh, it's not that they had 100 uh, pregnancy, but it's normalized 200 for some reason. So it's normalized 200, and then uh, uh, 31 were of these 100 were averted. So it's a pretty large impact of one piece of information that people didn't have. So one possibility is that somehow the information you know, doesn't go to so people don't know the impact. And another uh, paper by Pascaline also kind of pushes this information thing, information explanation, by looking at what happens if people get a first bed net for free, or the first offer of a bed net for free, they are more likely to actually get a bed net than people who got an offer for uh, uh, and we're asked to pay something. So this is not from the first experiment I showed you. This is from a second paper where she randomized at the individual level by giving people vouchers to buy, uh, um, uh, to buy a, a bed net. So in the first study, it was done in the health clinic and randomized at the health clinic level. This one, it was done in just distributing people vouchers and said you can buy yourself a, a long-lasting net either by, uh, uh, for free or, or by paying something. And the full price is about uh, uh, 500 or 600 shillings. So it goes, the subsidies were about to 50%, up to 50%, from 50% to 100%. And you find the same results that we already saw several times today, which is people are less likely to, to get a net if they, if they have to pay for it. Uh, but then what is interesting is that she looked at, she went back to these people six months later and she asked them if they wanted to buy a net at a price that were, I think, was uh, somewhere in the middle, um, at a price of 150 shillings, so kind of the mid-range price. So in the second period, everyone is offered the same discount. And then what we show in this, what she shows in this graph is depending on the offer they got in the first uh, period, are they likely to, are they more likely to get uh, the second, the second net? And what you find is people who got it for free or for very little money are more likely to purchase a net than people who were offered the net at some price. Which in a sense is pretty striking because they already have one. 
So for them, that's a second net. So the, the, the marginal uh, benefit of a second net should be lower than the be marginal benefit of a first net. And despite that, they are more likely to get one. This, by the way, again, goes against another sort of uh, argument of the people who think that we should always get, make people pay for things, which is that people get used to, uh, to handouts. And once you make people pay for something, they refuse to, uh, to pay for anything else. And what this graph shows is that instead people get used to nets rather than getting used to hands out. So it could be learning. Uh, it, could, it could be habit formation as well. So the, uh, sleeping under a net is a little painful. Uh, you have to set it up. It's a little bit uh, uh, hot inside. And so it, it has to kind of become part of your routine. Um, so one possibility also is just by having your first net, you got into this habit of, uh, of using the net, and therefore you, you continue. So if you wanted to separate the fact that uh, you, you provide an incentive for a behavior for a while, and then it goes away and people continue, can be interpreted either as learning about the benefits or the cost of this technology, saying actually it's not that hard to sleep under a net, or it's really super cool not to have mosquitoes, or my kid didn't get malaria for the whole six months, so this is really great. That's the sort of Pascaline's favored explanation. Or it could be a habit formation, which is it becomes less costly to you as you are getting used to it. So uh, there is a paper that I'm not going to go through uh, in, in detail now that by Reshma Hussam, who looks at uh, trying to build up a, a habit for uh, hand washing where she shows that, where she tries to set up tests that can allow you to distinguish between these two explanations in the case of hand washing. Yep. How long does it actually take to set up a bed net? What are like the actual steps that's going to happen? How long does it take to set up a bed net? Yeah. Well, depending how you set, set, it, set it up in your house. So typically people, uh, um, people uh, attach it to a hook on their roof. Once it's attached to the hook on the roof, it's like, it's really not much. You like, you have to unfold it every evening. So it's a few minutes. And then, so, so if you do that, if you set it, hook it up properly and put it, it's really not that bad. So if you have two nets, once you're operating in the process of attaching one net, the second one will take a shorter amount of time relative to the first one? I would say it would be similar. Because you have to, you you put it elsewhere in your house, and you put a second hat, your second second hook, and you. But yeah, you also would have known how to you you also would have learned how to do it to do it efficiently in a way that works for you. Yeah. So this uh, this conditional on having been offered a net for free, not having used. Uh, it's conditional of being being offered a net for free, and not even having it. Is, there... So these guys are more likely to have. Uh, uh, these guys are much more likely to have one. And of the people who have one, most people use it, in fact, regardless of how much they've paid for it. So it's, it's, uh, and it's not conditional on that. So those guys are actually more likely to have one and be using it. Could, could there be like a deadline story or something similar to a deadline story where you're, by having gotten an offer um, at zero and then seeing the difference in like the price increase, you might forecast, I'm like the next option I have to buy a bed net is going to be like 100%. Oh, that's right. You, are, you might forecast inflation in bed net prices and saying this is my last option. That's totally possible. That's a good point. You might saying if you forecast inflation, you're just going to buy now uh, in order to. But this, this, good, this good deal is definitely going away. That's a good. That's, I had not thought of that. That's a good, good idea. So, uh, so these two, just again, two pieces of evidence that suggest that there is a lot of things people don't know, and, uh, and that when they learn, they actually kind of adjust their behavior. And then the problem we have is that learning about health is really difficult. In particular, learning about preventive health and the difference between curative and preventive health is very difficult. So there is a very nice paper by uh, Jishnu Das, uh, and Monica Sanchez, where what they are looking at is, uh, is curative care. And, they, um, and again, this could be a, a model of Invermectin and why Invermectin became a, 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 a drug of choice in the case of COVID, even in 
even if in fact it doesn't work. Assuming that in fact it doesn't work. Why could people think that it works even when it doesn't work? Well, it's because COVID is like the flu. For a lot of people, it's self-limiting. That means that a lot of people will get better regardless. And so they take Invermectin or you know, you know, pink Gatorade, and then they get better. And, uh, uh, and then they can very easily attribute the fact of getting better to Invermectin or to pink Gatorade. So in the case of, uh, of, of uh, India, for in, uh, the same thing in many countries in Africa, people overuse antibiotic. And in a in very cr like creative way, uh, so for example, people will prescribe you one, one short course, what they call a short course of antibiotic, which is like one pill. You take antibiotic once, that doesn't help you. In fact, that doesn't help you. It creates resistance. It hurts everyone else. But you'll feel better if what you had was self-limiting. And then you think, well, that was great. This one shot of, an, pre preferably a, a, a shot, an actual shot. This one shot of an antibiotic had a great effect on me. Uh, so I, next time I'm thinking I'm going to do this again. And if you do that again a few times, every time you confirm your opinion that it really works out very nicely. Uh, so learning about doctor quality is really hard. And especially if it is hard for people to uh, uh, um, think about a model where you do nothing and you got better, you don't attribute it to doing nothing. Whereas if you do something and you get better, and especially if someone has told you, has given you the causal model, <laughs> saying this is, I'm doing this and you will get better, and in fact you get better, then it's hard to. So the, the, the kind of fake snake oil, snake oil, oil type medicine are more likely to, to take hold when with medicines that have this either this fluctuating tendency or the um, or, or self-limiting now with preventive care we're trying to understand the benefits of preventive care is really difficult because you do something nothing happens and then you know if you if the vaccine works and protects you you don't get covid or you don't get measles uh, at least there are a lot of COVID. So if you got, you know, if you're the one vaccinated person in a group of, uh, of unvaccinated people and you don't get it when everyone else gets, maybe you learn something. But even there, it's harder. But measles is not, you know, it's too frequent and kids die from it, but it's not that frequent. And so you might never really get an opportunity to experience it. And it's particularly difficult to link uh, cause and effect uh, in, in the cases like immunization which is uh, uh, contagious. So for example, uh, in the case of deworming, if everybody around you is dewormed, you won't get warmed, right? Regardless of whether you're dewormed or not. So if trying to understand the model and whether this deworming medicine works and you're comparing your, yourself who hasn't taken it to everyone else who has taken it, you're saying this thing is really not what it's made out to be. And the way that the benefits were sold to me were oversold. So uh, uh, in some sense, every time we try to explain uh, uh, the benefit of a vaccine to people, we are overselling it to them because we are try, uh, uh, trying to, to say this is the benefits. This is your private benefits are going to be huge. But in, it could be that the private benefits are huge in a way that is uh, 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 un, impossible to, to, uh, the, the, to assess for people. So that would explain why, uh, just a, a, with, without anything else, the standard information story would make people uh, quite uh, skeptical of the, of the benefits uh, and therefore uh, more indifferent than we think they ought to be, and therefore removing the puzzle. <laughs> In a sense, so now if they are mostly indifferent, then we can, re we can go back to going back to a little bit of uh, of uh, time inconsistency on top of a uh, huge uh, zone of indifference anyways will create a large number of uh, people who, whose behavior will look very inert and then the puzzle somehow dis disappears. On top of it, in this context where in f get, you know, forming your own models of the world is really hard because you don't have the right data and it's complicated and all that, you would imagine this is the place where trust would be 
the most important word. You have to have, if you cannot make up the story yourself, you have to have trust in the person who is giving, telling you to do it. Frankly, I have no real understanding of how mRNA vaccine work. Uh, and I, uh, I have no reason to do it from my own experience whether this will in implant a chip in my head that is going to make me an agent of the CIA. But I trust, you know, the people, the system, etc., to both reassure me on that they in fact work and that the randomized control trial have been done properly and so on and so forth, and that they don't have those side effects. But if you don't, so, and so this is where the trust in the government plays a key role, and our trust in official sources, the government, the nurses, the doctors, etc. But both in OECD countries and in developing countries, there has been a huge decline in the trust of government over the last uh, uh, 10, 20 years. In the US, it's at an extremely low level. So it is not entirely surprising that people do not, cannot get the whole story of the benefits because they don't understand the mechanism as they shouldn't be expected to and they don't trust the messenger. In developing countries, uh, uh, this mistrust in, in, in health services has uh, uh, in many cases some roots because public health, some public health campaign have been botched or some people have been using public health campaign to do other things than what they should be doing. So going back to our friend ABCD, uh, the ABCD uh, campaign uh, against uh, uh, HIV, quite explicitly, the government people will tell you that it's not just, uh, it's, not, it's not just about uh, HIV, but in addition, if kids were less promiscuous, it would have a lot of good you know, side effects. We wouldn't have uh, early pregnancies and all that. So we might as well scare them to death on HIV, and therefore we'll get these things as well. So we know, of course, that using a condom would be, uh, uh, would be good enough. You don't need to abstain. We know that uh, uh, if they had a sexual relationship only among themselves, it, it would be much safer for HIV. But we are not going to tell them because, well, we might as well get them to behave. So this is just to, as an example of this is not necessarily sinister motives, but there is always a tendency of slightly or misusing your power, information power over the people uh, uh, that you are supposed to instruct because well, you might as well get some benefit. This uh, 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 mistrust in the health system has huge impact in people believing uh, things like uh, uh, COVID vaccines, but also childhood vaccinations. For example, uh, in India, uh, there has been, uh, uh, during the emergency period uh, in, the, in the late 70s when Mrs. Gandhi was in power, there was a huge campaign of forced sterilization. And it was uh, disguised in many ways, and people were sent to camps, and people, people remember that. And so I've long believed, although I'm still, uh, haven't seen the study yet, I've long believed that the forced sterilization, that where people, in areas where you have more forced sterilization, there is more mistrust in, in the health system today and therefore less take up of services. So although this is a study I've always wanted to, to do and I've never seen a good version of it, although I've seen some not so good version of it, uh, for India, there is one paper that comes very, very close to it, uh, which is a, a paper by um, Sarah Lowe's and uh, Monteros, Montero, sorry, where they look at um, Cameroon, which used to be separated between France and, France and England uh, when during the colonial period, and is now one country. And the French and the British had different <laughs> ideas on different things, and in particular, at some point, the French got super worried about uh, 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 sleeping sickness. And they undertook a, a massive campaign against uh, sleeping sickness. Uh, uh, so they vaccinated everyone. Um, and the vaccine was not that good. And a lot of kids died. And it was just a bad uh, idea. And those places still have low trust in medicine today compared to comparable places in the same countries that were under British rule and that did not receive the, the, vac the same vaccination. Uh, so that's an example of uh, sort of long shadow of mistrust. 
Another example is uh, from the US is Marcella Alsen and the Marianne Wanamaker study on the, on the Tuskegee uh, uh, trials where places that are uh, further uh, closer to Tuskegee, <laughs> counties that are closer to Tuskegee have less trust in, in, in governments today. But that's, this is for, this is exactly the idea of, Tuskegee was like awful. And this was just misguided. Uh, if you see the, the I mean, this Tuskegee was actual like bad behavior, people lying, etc. This is just they were trying to do a public health campaign, and uh, turns out their product was not great. And this is still kids today are less vaccinated in those places uh, compared to very very close by places uh, which 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 were under British rule. Another paper along the same line, still on vaccination, is a paper by Monica Martinez Bravo and uh, Johannes Tegman uh, looking at the CIA vaccine rules. So when the Americans wanted to get uh, bin Laden, they needed to collect information about, uh, I think, the DNA of his kids. And they sent the guy to do some vaccination campaign in Pakistan where he was hiding uh, in order to collect uh, swabs, uh, to have swabs of the kids so they could uh, find out that it was in fact him. Uh, they found him, whatever, they killed him, and after that, uh, if you look at the places where that happens, uh, there is less vaccination today than in, than in other places. So that's another example. So, so this mistrust in the government, is, and, uh, and therefore, uh, contrary to the impact of uh, very well-targeted pieces of information, for example, how costly it is to use a net or uh, uh, you know, older men are more likely to be uh, HIV positive than younger men. You have a low impact of general kind of, trust me, you should do this without any concrete pieces of information attached to them. So in, in our study of the um, ABCD campaign, we find no impact of the ABCD uh, uh, campaign on behavior in the same setting where Pascaline find large effect of that more concrete piece of information. And also in Kenya, uh, Kramer and Miguel, along with the uh, deworming program, have a campaign where they're trying to tell people, kids, you know, don't, uh, don't walk barefoot, don't go fishing in the lake, and then that has zero impact. Um, that's because it, has a, it doesn't have a new information. It's just like some sort of general preaching message. And, that doesn't, uh, that, that's not effective. So that's the trust part. So now if we, uh, uh, if we are in this kind of setting, then you would, you would imagine that the, the social norm, the social equilibrium would play a pretty important role. First of all, because it can substitute or, uh, or, or on the contrary, annihilate whatever trust exists in the system. If uh, a community sort of uh, uh, arrange at, uh, 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 kind of agrees to a, to a common behavior. Second of all, because since people understand, or if people understand that uh, the benefits to immunization is mainly social, then uh, whether or not, you know, the, uh, whether or not there is a social sanction or social, uh, uh, reward associated with taking a social action uh, can create the benefits. Now people see that, okay, I'm mainly doing this for the community as far as I can understand. Is the community going to be grateful to me and going to manifest this gratefulness or not? Uh, so uh, one way in which that, you know, you could help the community, reward people who are doing the right thing for the community, is by helping people signal that they are the right kind of people. So when you go to vote, you get a, like, I voted sticker. When people get vaccinated, uh, uh, sometimes also they get sticker. I don't know if you got, I, I got vaccinated stickers. I didn't get one. <laughs> In France, they don't give one, they give you one, but, but um, um, or for example, when doctors get, uh, also in France, when a health worker gets vaccinated for the flu, they get a badge to say, I'm vaccinated, that's to protect you, that kind of things. 
Uh, so Anne Kering did a very nice experiment. It was her job market paper, by the way, so it's worth reading it in order to you know, get a sense of uh, what you could do as a student. Um, she, uh, she said, let's try and signal, uh, the, the help people signal that they are, oops, the type of people who get, uh, who immunize their kids, uh, either because they're good parents or because they are good for the community. So they give, si they give silicon uh, bracelet uh, to show that you have completed the sequence of immunization. She randomized that at the village level and she found, or the health center level, and she finds that in places where uh, the bracelets were given at the end of the sequence, uh, bracelets were very popular and they do increase immunization. Now, one question for you. How do you, how does she know, how could, do you know that it's uh, signaling per se, that you're a good person, uh, and what else could it be? Yeah. We want to make sure that um, if, if these are a form of like verifying that he's actually been immunized, whereas relative to before, there's no way of verifying it, so that businesses couldn't act on it. If you want to make sure that the businesses aren't like blocking people from being able to enter things or use certain services on account of now they have like a formal verification device. Yes, yeah, so you would see, so here, by the way, it's not just businesses, it's like basically people around, it's not that people use that like we use it in France to go anywhere, but it's a way of saying, of, well, in her mind, it's a way of showing you've been immunized to your friend and everything. And, and as you say, well, the point is that like, how do you know that people understand that it's in fact signaling that, that it's in fact a verification for that? And if it's not, why would people why would you anyway see potentially an impact of the bracelet? Yeah. Like yeah, maybe, maybe people just like the bracelets. Uh, so you think, well, it's really tiny, but remember people when uh, got vaccinated for a kilo of lentils and a silicone bracelet is more fun than a bracelet uh, for your kid is more fun than a kilo of lentils. So people might just like it, right? Um, so what she does uh, to test that, and that's a nice feature of the experiment, is that she introduced a treatment which has uninformative bracelets where everybody gets a bracelet anyways. Uh, and then you can compare the uninformative bracelets to the informative bracelets that you get after having completing the sequence. And in fact, although it's not quite how the paper is written, but if you look at the table, in fact, the, the uninformative bracelet, so that's the part where I think she got maybe con very uh, happy with her results and she wanted to, but if you look at the table, the uninformative bracelets are about as effective as the informative bracelets. So one way to read this is that it didn't, you know, it, you can't really reject that people just like bracelets and that it's not the signal that works out but it was super well designed to figure it out. And uh, you know, now she's doing another one on deworming where maybe we'll, we'll find a, a more of a difference between signaling and... Uh, so with many of these explanations, the uh, information, uh, trust, conveying the social norms, uh, the social networks are likely to play a key role. Um, so the, the idea then is how do you kind of activate the social network in, uh, in the case of immunization or preventive good to your benefits to kind of, and of course the common idea is, uh, is to, uh, to activate it via people who are influential in a network. Uh, and uh, in the, in the COVID-19 people, it was done both by trying to activate uh, stars and by trying to activate uh, uh, more uh, locally influential people like church leader, community leader, etc. So uh, starting with stars, uh, uh, Vivi Alates, uh, Ben Olken, Rima Hanna, and a bunch of other people on this paper have a paper on the role of stars in uh, promoting vaccination messages uh, again, childhood vaccination messages. And what they do is that they use local stars so that they have geographical, you know, they have geographical uh, differences and randomize at that level. And they, sh and they have their, their, their many stars which are on their different uh, kind of uh, groups of people on Twitter. Um, 
uh, either uh, uh, spra write in their own voice or just uh, retweet the messages by WHO. And what they find is that the most effective is when a star writes in her own voice, I, you know, so glad that my kid got immunized or I think immunization is important or something like that. So, and that those messages are much more likely to be liked and to be retweeted and so on and so forth. We don't know, they don't have, they can't test immunization status, unfortunately. So it's all about that communication by star and vaccines get powerful. Uh, Abhijit uh, and the same Ben, uh, Rima, uh, uh, Arun have a paper uh, that uh, Larry Katz called the Banerjee effect, uh, which we did uh, at the, uh, in May of 2020 at the very beginning of the at the very beginning of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We had Abhijit uh, who. Uh, who at the same at the time had was, was a star for two reasons for in West Bengal. First, because of the Nobel Prize in India, they take their Nobel Prizes seriously. So he's like like literally on a, on billboards and magazines and all that. Like it's uh, something crazy actually. Uh, when he goes to India, at, when he arrives at the airport in Kolkata, there are like people thronging and uh, he has to be put in a police car and all that. <laughs> I, I took it, if I t if I go to India with him, I let him go, and with the kids we go some other way. <laughs> so we don't know that guy. <laughs> anyway, so we try and put it to good use, and and, and another reason why he was kind of potentially uh, famous, relevantly famous in this context, is because he was uh, still is actually the the Fauci for West Bengal, uh, without the medical expertise, he's the chairman of the. Uh, COVID-19 Prevention Commission. Uh, so he recorded short videos and they were sent by uh, people uh, to, uh, by, um, to people via SMS uh, to about, it was randomized at the geographical level to about 20 million people uh, in, uh, in West Bengal, randomized at the zip code, the equivalent of the zip code level. And uh, uh, the videos, so we tried uh, different variation in a message and we, we also, uh, and, and the main outcome was, so, but all of the message encouraged people to practice social distancing and to uh, report symptoms to the ASHA, to the local health worker. And then we looked at, uh, at whether the ASHA reported that anyone reported symptom to her in the first few days after after the messages were sent and therefore uh, um, so we could be sure it's not that we increased COVID-19 prevalence with this message and therefore more symptoms were there to be reported. And anyway, what we found is a doubling of rate at which re symptoms were reported to the ASHA as well as more self-reported uh, uh, um, social distancing of various kinds which doesn't seem to come from information because people receive about 20 messages a day anyways and seem to be pretty well informed, but more about uh, kind of an extra nudge of like doing the work. So it does seem that this, these stars, uh, kind of public figure, have uh, potentially an impact. Uh, the idea of the Biden immunization core uh, 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 immun was, was to use uh, locally influential people and this is something which you find a lot of in developing countries where you try to, whatever, when you have something to sell, a uh, public health campaign or a new product, you try and identify in the community people that are uh, influential. Uh, so the problem is who is influential? Uh, and the way that the traditional way to get at that is the sort of you know in advance. So for example, in the in the case of the microcredit uh, organization that you read for the paper you read on gossips, you could think these are people who, uh, these are the shopkeepers, the teachers, the self-help group members, etc. The religious leaders are the ones that were used by the Biden campaign. But the, the, what, we, what we found in that, uh, in, in, for, in a paper, for example, on the uh, diffusion of microfinance, what we found is that it doesn't necessarily work, that a lot of these people who are supposed to be influential are really not that influential. And if you hit one of these persons that you think is influential and you spread information to them, then information goes nowhere. 
So you would like to find uh, people who are influential, and it's hard to do. And uh, uh, so that's where the, the, the gossips idea came up, uh, is to find a way to, to find these influential people. So what's the idea uh, of, of gossips? That's the paper or the first paper you read. Yeah. Identify people who would be good at spreading information by just asking people who would be good at spreading information. Exactly. So it's asking in the community, finding a few people and asking them, well, who do you, you know, if I have a piece of information, uh, uh, who do you think I should give it to? And the reason why, so, so that seems pretty straightforward, let's just, you know, ask people. Uh, we know that community members have information. For example, in a paper by uh, Ben and Vivi and Rima and Abhijit, we know that they, are, they know who is poor, for example, so they know some stuff about their village. Uh, we know that they are, they are good at identifying people who are productive. So that's a paper by Ben Roth, Natalia Rigol, and, and Reshma Hussam who is basically suggesting that people know in their community who would make good use of 1,000 rupees or 10,000 rupees of a loan, of a grant. Uh, and they know better than we could by trying to run a regression and do machine learning or whatever. So that's, you know, that would be that first order. That's not a crazy thing to say. But the thing with uh, 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 being influential in a network, that might be harder because Getting a full view of your, of your network, people don't have. Like, for example, I know who my friends are. I might know who the friends of my friends are, but I don't know who the friend of my friend of my friends are. And you would think in order to know who is influential in the network, if that's related to your central location in the network, uh, you, would, uh, you, would, you would be uh, quite lost. Especially as many of you have mentioned, networks get uh, divided. There is some segregation in the network. So you might, even, you might only have the idea of about half the village at best. Um, so why would they know? Uh, so w one way to, to think about this is to say, well, what does it mean to be influential in the network? So in a diffusion sense, someone wanted a graph uh, one who, one of you who commented, wanted to see a graph of uh, of centrality. So here is one. So here is a, a what it what it means to be influential in a diffusion sense. If you have a model where people simply pass information with some probability to the people in their edge, and the process is repeated for a number of periods. So this is, if you have a piece of information, you'll pass it uh, half t uh, half the time, let's say, and for four periods. So First, I give information to them. Then they give it to one of their two friends. Then the process is done again. He gives it to another friend. Uh, and this one gives it to two of their friends. And then they again, that continues again. And then this is over. And I count in expectation how many people in that uh, uh, have learned it from them. So that's diffusion centrality. Here is another example of someone who is a little bit more remote him, here. So after four periods, the, on ex in expectation, only six percent have heard the news. So diffusion centrality is the total expected number of times information starting at point I has reached everybody else. So it's the probability of passing the information times uh, w uh, each of the links uh, to the power of the number of periods, and then summed up. It's related to other measures of centralities you might have heard. For example, people who, who have, if there was only one period, it would be proportional to degree, your number of friends. If there was an infinite number of periods, it would become eigenvector centrality. And for any number of periods, you know, if the process die out uh, after a few periods of transmission, people get tired of uh, uh, conveying this particular piece of news, then it's going to be somewhere in between the two. So the question now becomes more, more precise, is whether we think that despite having a, a fairly poor uh, representation of the network architecture, people might be able to identify people who have high uh, uh, DC. So the, the, the f first of all, in theory, we could think that hitting people with high diffusion centrality would be effective to diffuse information. 
as it turns out, in practice, that's true as well. Uh, so for example, uh, 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 Moshfik Mubarak, Lori Biman, and Ariel Reshef have a paper where they are looking at uh, introducing a new technolo agricultural technology in a village. And they show that if, you, uh, if they hit uh, people who are eigenvector central, uh, the information circulates faster. Uh, um, in our paper, uh, our first uh, diffusion paper, where we looked at this kind of seeds that were um, supposedly influential people, if they in fact are diffusion central, the, the information circulates and people take up microfinance. But if they are not, then the information doesn't. So there seems to be a correlation there as well. So that seems that if you could hit the diffusion central people, it would be good. But uh, do people have a reason to, to know that? And uh, the, the way that they could find out is because although they don't know the centrality of someone, they already know how many times, or they might have an idea of how many times they have heard about, about that person. So now it's not just hearing a, a piece of news coming from that person, but hearing about that person. So suppose that there are some news, like uh, you know I got a new goat or uh, Matt changed jobs, and the probability uh, that uh, this gossip uh, circulates uh, is passed from one node to another. And the only thing people can keep track of is how many times they've heard that news. And if the news is of interest, then it will be, it'll be circulating by many edges, and uh, people are more likely to hear it if, they have, if the original person about whom the news is has more friends who have found out about the news and themselves have more friends to whom they can spread this news. So the formula is different than the, than, uh, the formula for diffusion centrality, but it's related. It's now the number of times uh, uh, I've heard about a piece of news. And so um, the diffusion centrality tracks how the info spread from a given node. And the network gossip traps how often I hear about an info that originates from other nodes. So if you compare uh, this formula to uh, the other ones, it's not the same, but it's related. And the intuition for why it's related is because if people have a lot of friends who themselves have a lot of friends, on the one hand, anything they say will circulate a lot, and also any news about them will circulate a lot. So, you, uh, uh, so if, if you have enough communication period, the two will actually be... Uh, uh, converge to, to each other uh, and remain very uh, correlated. So, and in fact, with infinite number of periods, they'll just be uh, the same. They'll eventually uh, converge to be exactly the same. Uh, and the, the intuition is that one, that people who are popular uh, can convey a piece of news and also pieces of news about them convey. So, uh, the I have heard many times about uh, Aaron also means that when Aaron has a piece of news, many people have heard it. So you can see that it's not the same object. It's I have heard about him versus he has reached a lot of people, but the two are correlated because they're related to the information passing from one edge to the other. So that's the idea of gossip. And so what this suggests if that theory is correct, is that first of all, people should have relative agreement about who the central people are. Uh, there should be quite a bit of consensus because they are the same within the network. So you can you know, introspect whether in your class it's the same person. The, you know, if you have a piece of news, you don't want to spread who you should go see and uh, you should not tell it and vice versa. Um, and uh, and also and and uh, and uh, uh, and that it should you know and that if an information gets transmitted to one of these people, it should in fact uh, spread well. 
And the then you could even have an advantage over the properly calculated m uh, value of eigenvector centrality or diffusion centrality because in addition, you ask the, you ask the question um, if, uh, uh, who is good at transmitting information. If you can kind of calculate how many times you've heard about them. In addition, you might know that these are gregarious people who likes to talk a lot. And so that is something that's not captured by this very simple model where everyone has the same queue, but could be incorporated by someone about them. So you could do even better if you can do this simple, e if this simple exercise of counting the piece of news is in fact uh, going to give you a good sense of people, places, and network, you can do even better by, by uh, uh, um, uh, 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 adding other things you ha end up knowing about them. So that's the idea. So on, on Wednesday, we're going to see how that fails and then how that compares with other things uh, that one could also do in one context and may, you know, shift, think also a bit more methodologically about how one on even answer these questions. And then we'll shift to, given this model of demands, thinking about how uh, the mess that healthcare supply becomes. Thank you so much.